What's up? Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the amazing Ultimate Mage Himiko Yumeno Magical Analysis! And this time we delve into what makes Himiko a great character. So sit back and enjoy the magic show. The story begins on the day of Himiko seeing a local mage perform a magic show for the very first time, the moment when she took an interest in magic, when her powers as a mage have awoken inside her. The local mage saw the potential that Himiko had and took her under his wing as an apprentice. Her master taught her many things about the role of mages and how to become a powerful one. Himiko idolized her master so much, she started taking some of her master's traits like pretending that the magic tricks are actual magic, or that she is a mage, thus becoming part of Himiko's personality as we know her, but also a part of her escapism problem that will soon engulf her world. After some time passes under her master's teachings, she becomes much more powerful, more talented and popular in the eyes of the mortals that have witnessed her magic for so long, fan letters being sent to her a lot more. Her master, however, started to become forgotten in their eyes, calling him old-fashioned. It all slowly drained him of his magic. The more time passes, the more it became apparent. The apprentice was outgrowing her master. This was the beginning of Himiko's difficult road that she would take, a period of darkness in the beautifully magical life she had back then. A period so painful to her, even thinking about it, makes her stare at her feet, shoulders shaking, feeling sad and guilty for this and the events that transpire afterwards. It all reaches a big climax, when during a magic show her master made a mistake because of all the pressure that has built inside him lately, and the mortals turned against him, calling him names, yelling at him to get out of the stage, wanting to see Himiko instead. Her master was ashamed. For him to be seen like this not only by the mortals, but by Himiko as well, who has idolized him all this time. For him to show such weakness in front of her, it was the worst day a grand mage like him could ever have. All this made even worse when Himiko herself stepped in, confronted the mortals, trying to fix the problem and protect her master. The once known very powerful grand mage of the world, not only ashamed of his weakness, but also Himiko trying to clean up his mistake. And thus, the story ends, with the master's disappearance right after the magic show, the embarrassment that he felt making him retire, leaving Himiko all alone, without ever saying goodbye to her. Till this day, Himiko has carried this burden with her, the feeling she has of being responsible for her master's fall, for her to believe that her increasing fame has led the biggest idol in her life to end up becoming a nobody. It was a period that has emotionally damaged her. What makes the Himiko that we have seen in the first chapters of the killing game and the one from back when her master was still with her different from one another is, well, expressing emotions. She has confronted the audience by expressing herself, opening up to them and trying to fix the problem. And since her master left after that, you can clearly see why not expressing herself, bottling up her emotions during the killing game was her method of trying to survive it, since, in her mind, she didn't want to do a similar mistake which would end up in her death. Her feelings of guilt are painfully clear in the way she talks about her past, feeling tired of talking about her past at times and leaving it there, closing her eyes, inhaling a deep breath after we asked her to tell us what happened next telling us her story differently in a way that would justify her master's disappearance, like how the letters and gifts sent to Himiko, telling her how great she is, were seen as a bunch of lies, a trap to make her master leave, telling us about the anti-mage who set up her master behind the scenes, taking away his magic, being responsible for his demise. She talks like this as a means of trying to suppress her feelings of guilt using the one thing that has taken root inside Himiko's heart ever since that period of her life, the one thing she uses from then till now in the next story of her life, which becomes one of the central points of her struggles in the early chapters of the killing game.
escapism. Prepare to be amazed. Fall to your knees. I am Himiko Yumeno, the ultimate mage. Enter Himiko Yumeno, the ultimate mage. The youngest person to have ever won the Magician of the Year award of the group called the Magic Castle, also known as the Hall Magicians, where the world's magic lovers gather. Despite the painful history that she had, Himiko continued to gain popularity because of her talent. But as it is expected of the harsh life of a mage, her magic is being disguised by the Hall of Magicians as tricks. It is said that mere mortals are not yet ready to witness the true potential of her magic, and that it will cause chaos in the human society. Which kind of makes me think that she would be a really nice addition to this Goldoree Pleasant series. But, but I digress. She definitely strikes us as a mage, as we can clearly see by her trademark mage item number one. The Mage Hat. The Black Witch Hat. Her most notable piece of her uniform with a red strip and a small pin on it. We also have her trademark mage item number two. The brown pointy medieval shoes with white ribbons tied around her ankles, which are actually called Pola. Uh, Himiko, do you know how to pronounce this? Sorry. Either way, both the witch hat and the pointy shoes are some among the traits she got from her master way back when she was his apprentice. Moving on, she also wears brown tights, bubble balloon red skirt, black blazer with gray accents, with a blouse underneath a brown sweater vest. She also has an insignia on the pocket of her blaze, which represents the previous high school that she went to, called Dreamforest Girls High. Her name, Himiko in kanji, represents Secret Child, and Yumino represents Dreamfield. Putting two and two together, and you get Secret Child of White Dreams. She's voiced by the Japanese voice actress Aimi Tanaka and the English voice actress Christine Mary Cabanos, who is known for voicing Chaki Nanami. Last but not least, her familiar is a freaking tiger cub, yo! <laughs> you need to get it, it's so cute, huh? <laughs> and thus, with the magic get up all set, Himiko embarks on a new journey, a new chapter in the story of her life, which will have her face hell and become a great mage. The killing game has begun and Himiko shows no restraint in giving us an important piece in her characterization. She is scared as fuck, yo! Arguably, she was the most terrified in the entire pool of students, thus kickstarting her escapism in the story we are shown. She knows it very well that she is seen as the easiest target in such a game like this, and the last thing she wants to do is show that fear to everyone, thus telling us that there is no need to panic, and we just have to keep calm, trying to show that she has courage. Granted, that did the opposite of what she intended. As time goes on, her method of avoiding the horror of the killing game is affecting her emotionally more and more, to the point of draining her of all her life energy. And nowhere is it better showcased than in her relationship with Angie and Tenko in the second and the third chapter. Himiko will use anything imaginable to ease the pain she is feeling through the killing game early on. And alongside her insistence on magic being real, and using it to project her negative thoughts and use it to try and calm herself since magic is what she loves. She starts hanging with Angie, thus slowly turning into believing in Atua and yet a new attempt at escaping the reality of this killing game. Himiko turning to believing in Atua and Tenko being upset at this showcases the struggles she's going through and how damaging it can be in the very long run. Even if she thinks all her insecurities and loneliness are gone, which references her masters abandoning her, the pain that made her want to die are gone. It is only a matter of time till that new lifestyle that she chose will be crushed. We move on to the magic show that both Himiko and Angie threw, and soon enough things go down south as we see Ryoma get eaten by the piranha in the water tank as soon as the mage made her escape. And with this, it begins. The curse. Oh, the curse of being accused of murder and being in bad situations in general. This magic show turns horribly for Himiko as not only her attempts at making her fellow classmates smile in times of sadness failed miserably, but her being seen as the prime suspect of Ryoma's murder as well. Which, I might add, also felt guilt for Ryoma's death because of her magic show when the next chapter starts. Himiko has already been dealing with a lot of anxiety till now, thus she is using her love for magic even more to cope with the situation that she is in, 
especially in the trial when people started debating over Himiko's status as either the killer or innocent, and she became more difficult to deal with due to her insistence on magic. And... Okay, I'll come back to this moment at the end of the analysis. And thus, when the world around Himiko started to become more and more dark, Tenko comes in to defend her. This is the moment when Himiko starts seeing Tenko from a new angle than the creepy stalker she has been like till now. And this is also a turning point for Tenko when, even if her words here say otherwise, from this point on, no longer is Tenko seeing Himiko as this cute mage to obsess over, but as a human being with deep-rooted problems. It is around this point when Tenko realizes what Himiko is truly going through, suffering because of her coping mechanism and not expressing her emotions. And Himiko sees Tenko differently than before, and gains appreciation for how supportive she is here, that she is also a good person despite her obsessiveness and creepy behavior at times. Himiko's character development reaches its climax in Chapter 3, as Tenko becomes a spy for the student council in order to help Himiko. When Himiko's reliance on Atua reaches a really high point, it is here when Tenko tries to snap her out of it, trying to make her show her true emotions, what she is feeling, even yelling at her to do so. This ends in failure as not only Tenko leaves upset, but Himiko is also affected about this when she herself knows how dangerous this can be to her life. Himiko's struggles become even bigger and becomes increasingly depressed after Angie dies her one friend she could count on to be alongside her when she felt lonely. With her death, she realizes that her dependence on Atua will not save her from the killing game, thus being forced into the horrific reality that she is in once again. She decided to try out Kurekyo's seance in order to speak to Angie one last time. At the seance, Tenko comes in to give Himiko her last speech about how important it is to express her emotions that showing sadness and anger is not bad, and that Himiko should do so in order to break the chains of her destructive curse that she put in an attempt to protect herself. Himiko sees how supportive Tenko is once again being moved by her speech. But just when things would turn out for the better in Himiko's life, Tenko gets killed as well during the seance. This completely destroys Himiko, forgetting what Tenko said to her before the seance, and thus closing herself inside even more. That day, she lost her friend Angie, and the one person who truly knew what Himiko was going through, and has been helping her by being alongside her, Tenko, has died. And thus, during the third trial, she is facing complete despair. We see her at her lowest. Whatever weapons she had in combating this killing game are useless to her now. Magic, Atua, Angie, and even Tenko, they're all gone leaving her feel the loneliest person in that room. No. It's okay. It's no surprise he'd think that. I know I ignored Tanko before. That's why... I'm so upset now. I should have faced Tanko. Worked things out with her while she was still alive. But now... It's too late. <laughs> I can't complain to her, or thank her. This is very important in understanding what Himiko truly felt about Tenko this whole time. Obviously, given the way Tenko acted around her in chapters 1 and the first half of chapter 2, it is no surprise that Himiko didn't really like her early on. And it is completely understandable, what with Tenko's creepiness showing at times. But there is no denying that from the second trial onward, Himiko started warming up to her as well, because of how thankful she was for Tenko defending her in the trial, and worrying for her health before Angie's death and the seance. This line that she says right here shows us the guilt she has over not expressing her gratitude towards her for those moments, telling her that she was also a good person despite her obsessiveness, of how caring Tenko was for her. She feels guilt here over not discussing this with Tenko, to sort things out, to straighten things out regarding her obsessiveness. Himiko in the end appreciated Tenko, but that appreciation was never shown to Tenko due to her inability to express herself at this point in time. And now, with the students starting to suspect Himiko for Tenko's death, not only is she facing guilt and fear, but is now lacking any will to live and is tired of what is happening to the point of no longer caring whether she is being voted or not. She has fallen into complete depression, until she is reminded of Tenko's last words. 
to live life facing forward and give her the strength she needs to continue, to find Angie and Tenko's killer. Because if she didn't, then Tenko's words would have meant nothing. She realizes that if there is a way to apologize to Tenko for the way she was, it would be for her to continue to live her life and survive. But there was one final component that Himiko needed in order to reawaken as a mage. Outside of just living her life facing forward, she also needed to remember Tenko's remaining last words before her death, and that is to not hold back on her emotions. That attempting to protect herself by not expressing her emotions is the worst thing that she could do, and instead she should train her heart to accept her feelings of sadness and anger and release them. And with her final pieces of memories needed to break the curse being brought back, with nothing left to hold her back anymore, she lets all of her pain her sadness and loneliness out, and pours her heart out in one big cry. Thus, the seal has been lifted. It is at this point that Himiko has reawakened once again as a mage. By breaking the curse that she herself has casted upon her, she now understands that in order to honor Tenko's words, she would need to survive, live life facing forward, and not hide her true self anymore. This is the beginning of her finally finding the strength to overcome her coping mechanism and using her emotions as her biggest weapons in surviving this hell. It is not hiding away from reality that will make her achieve victory, but facing it with everything she got and living her life facing forward for Angie and Tenko's sake. With the start of the fourth chapter, we see Himiko showing us her true mage side, expressing her true emotions and not letting anything get in her way to show that she means business from now on. Now some of you would say that this is a big problem when it comes to Himiko's character, that her character development is far too sudden here, that there is nothing left to be told, and that she is seen as just a comic relief for the rest of the kid again. <laughs> Good balls. You just make me want to pat your head for thinking such an absurd thing and yell OBJECTION! Let's make something perfectly clear here folks. Himiko's development is not too sudden. First off, let's go back a little to chapter 1 when Himiko and Angie announced that they were gonna do a magic show. At that point, we all have seen a side of Himiko that we have never seen till that point. And that is the true Himiko. That is one of the very few times when Himiko shows her true joyous side. One of the rare moments in the first three chapters when Himiko is not blocked by her coping mechanism. Because it was then when she thought that she found herself the calmest. Because she had both Angie and Magic on her side to protect her. This proves to us without a shadow of a doubt that her expressing herself like that at the beginning of chapter 4 is not the first time she ever felt this joyous. It's not that she was inherently sad or emotionless her entire life or something, but it was her inability to show her emotions during the killing game, the thing that stopped her from being her true self. Second, the game makes it perfectly clear that even if she shows that she found her true strength and then nothing will stop her from now on, that she's turning a new leaf, she's still struggling to maintain that and to know exactly what to do from now on. Because not only is she already overexerting herself because of putting herself out there too much at the beginning of chapter, running out of breath and all that, not only is she trying to find confirmation in Shuichi that she's showing more emotion when we were exploring near Tenko's dojo, but when she started running a lot later and was breathing so hard she would vomit her heart out right there, Himiko is telling us painfully clear that she doesn't know what to do that she decided to live life facing forward for Tenko's and Angie's sake, but she doesn't know what she is actually supposed to do exactly. It's, it's kind of like when you are feeling really down, or you decide to train your body. You wake up in the morning and you are all, yeah, alright, a new bright day, I'm gonna train so hard from now on, I'll improve it so many ways, let's do this, yeah! And then you overexert yourself so much, you start feeling ill, and you are back to square one, feeling down. It's one thing to have the spirit, 
but it's another thing to have the spirit and the right mindset to achieve your goal. And that is exactly what Himiko was trying to find, the right mindset to achieve her new goal of honoring Tenko's last words. And how does she do that? Well, by trying to be useful and helping everyone survive, which is her second arc in the story in the last three chapters of the killing game. Her story is not over, her character development is not over, and she's not just a comic relief from this point on. She still has her own story to tell us. So, what does she do to prove herself useful to the rest of the students and help? Well, first of all, her contributing to the trials is a good start. And let me just say this now, folks. You saying that Himiko is useless after the third chapter is just is just so wrong. I don't even know where to start. Like, first of all, I could just slap you all in the face, those of you who think that. Second, you people are just downright wrong in saying that she is the Yasuhiro slash Akane of the V3. Because Himiko is really trying her best to move the discussion, even if she's not the smartest cookie there. She has definitely shown us that she is a lot more active in these next trials than the first three. Not only by reaching some great solutions by herself, best example I can give is her idea of using the Electro Hammer on the Exasos if he decide to lie and have Shuichi confront Maki. But seriously, in general she always speaks her mind regarding the situation at hand and tries to move the conversation. Like she always tries to help and it is a huge contrast from the early chapters when most of what she did is talk about magic. I mean, just just listen to some of her lines in the fourth trial. Now we know the mansion and chapel were actually next to each other, but the problem is the wall between them. If that's the case, Miyu's avatar must have hit the chapel wall really hard. We felt the impact all the way from the inside of the chapel. If it made that much noise, it must have built up a lot of speed. But then why did Mew say there was only one signboard? Toilet paper was the murder weapon! And speaking of magic talk, it is because of her wanting to prove useful that she doesn't just talk about magic as much as she did before. But instead, she's showing us that she can be quite serious as well, while also offering a few cute magic remarks here and there to show us that she hasn't completely lost her love for magic. So for those of you who weren't a fan of her being a constant magic catchphrase machine in the first three chapters, you should totally feel relieved in that she is a lot more varied in the way she acts, the way she talks, and just offering a lot more variety as a comic relief character since well, it does make sense in the context of her story as well, because she's no longer using magic anymore as a means of escaping the reality that she's in. We move on to chapter 5, when even if she tries her best to contribute with all she can in the trials, it is not enough in her eyes. So she finds her golden opportunity in the form of Spaceman himself, Kaito Momota, when he asks her to get him a crossbow in order to fight back. This was her shot at being useful and living up to Tenko's words. But it all goes down south once again, as not only is Kaito found presumably dead the next day, but Himiko senses from the very beginning that people are gonna suspect her of Kaito's murder if people were to find out that she had something to do with the crossbow. First signs were when Kibo said in the dining hall that he saw something suspicious last night, and Himiko is questioning what he's saying, thinking that she must have been seen carrying the crossbow case. She gets increasingly worried, and when the trial is on, Himiko gets scared and starts defending herself, which, once again, it is a huge contrast from the way Himiko was in the third trial. She is defending herself. Wait! Don't say it's me! Maki is more suspicious than I am! I said I'm not the culprit! I swear! N no! That was probably... Tsumugi cosplaying as me! Wait! That's wrong! I just brought it there! I didn't shoot it! It's the truth! Please believe me! Not you! If you believe me, it makes me look like I'm lying! Now I know what you're thinking. Well, why not tell everyone from the start instead of hiding it? That would have solved the problem. Um, yeah, I, I doubt it would be as easy as you may think. I mean, maybe you should try and do that and see how that will go. Because even if she were to tell everyone straight what happened, more than likely, she still would have been accused of murder given how most students tend to point their fingers at each other like Phoenix on a ramen day. She said it herself, 
She was scared. She didn't think rationally. She even tried to pin this on Maki so that she wouldn't be accused anymore. In the end, everyone figures out that it couldn't have been that Himiko killed Kaito. And Himiko apologizes to Maki for saying that she was the one that used the crossbow. And thus, Himiko's attempt at proving herself to be useful and help the students ended in failure in her eyes that day. Chapter 6 kicks in, and Himiko is desperately trying her best to be useful to everyone since her last attempt ended in failure. She goes to Rantaro's lab to try to find clues, but she becomes increasingly angry over not being of any help. And when she stays back to search the room where Morakuma was, the shot from Kibo's gun creates a cave-in and blocks the way out of the room, leaving Himiko stuck inside. It would seem that all hope is lost for Himiko. Until she escapes the room by herself and finds us later, telling us that she found the secret passageway in the girl's bathroom. And thus, Himiko's mission was a success. And she becomes happy that she was able to help everyone in solving the mystery behind the kitty game, since without that very important clue, we wouldn't have been able to figure out that Tsumugi was the mastermind. And if Himiko didn't decide to try and help, and stay in the room to investigate more, and nobody else was going to investigate there or figure out that there was, there was the secret passageway, then it all would have ended there. She spent the last half of the killing game trying to contribute and be helpful, and exposing Tsumugi as the mastermind is the final hit that concludes her mission and she can finally relax knowing that she was able to fulfill Tenko's last wish of surviving, helping the students. And to end her story, Put an end to this motherfucking killing game for good! It's the only weapon I've got! I'll use my life to put an end to this killing game! Kazing! And that concludes Himiko's entire story in the killing game. And wow, was it a roller coaster. Now, inevitably, even if I have been singing praises to Himiko, I think it is time for me to address some problems that people may have with her. Share my thoughts about some particular moments, Try to make you understand that some of these problems are not actual problems at all in the end, if you are to look into it a little more. And address some problems that I myself have when it comes to Himiko's character that, that cannot be defended till the end. Because it sure wouldn't be fair to analyze one of my favorite girls, Danganronpa, one that I love so much without mentioning some flaws, right? Because no student is perfect in the end. The one problem that I have with Himiko, which I might add, is mostly the only biggest problem that I have with her, is the magic debate in the second trial. But before you all write it off as a huge flaw, moving on and calling her Satan's anus for the way she was, let's analyze this moment a little and see what we're getting out of this. As I have mentioned in part 3 of the analysis, Himiko is using her love for magic as a way to cope with the situation that she is in. Especially when she is becoming suspicious since Ryoma was murdered and his body was used in her magic show. I get it. That is, that is what they were trying to show in this segment in my eyes. Her growing stress and paranoia and caving into her mage persona, which connects with her character and her arcs. And, well, this is a matter of her love for magic in general and how a magician is never supposed to reveal how they did their tricks, because if they did, then the magic show would be pointless, and it would ruin the intended result of making people smile. The one thing that Himiko had for making the students smile in this killing game, her magic show, fails in the end because people went out of their way to reveal how the magic worked when Himiko did not want that. I mean, I get all this, but ultimately, it just does not make her look good in the eyes of the students and the players at all. Because what Himiko is ultimately doing here is getting everyone killed by not revealing how her magic works. And this problem actually branches into two more broader problems in general that are the reason why Himiko is seen in bad light here. Number one, the comic relief role overshadowing the human side of the character. Now, I'm gonna say this, Himiko is one that I find to be a great character in my eyes, that was handled really well in the killing game, but it's not perfect though. Now remember, we have seen Himiko feel responsible for a lot of things, like her master's disappearance, 
the fact that she wasn't able to save Ryoma's body before getting eaten, for not discussing things with Tenko before her death, for being the way she was in the first three chapters in general, even seeing herself being punished for the way she was. She apologizes to everyone that she lied in chapter 5, and telling us that it was because she was scared of being accused of murder that she did what she did. And she apologized to Maki for saying that she did it. Like all this, all the stuff that I have listed right now, it, it tells us one thing. She feels regret for her actions. Therefore, it is wrong for you people to say that she is a completely selfish person to the core. She has her selfish moments, but she's also a human that makes mistakes. She's not the brightest cookie and it can be very irrational due to being afraid. And most of all, he is aware of most of the things she did and feels regret for the bad stuff she did. However, that is not always the case. And what I said now contradicts with the way Himiko acts here because, well, she doesn't apologize for being stubborn in the eyes of the students. And it's just... odd. She can be selfish, but... I'm gonna have to say that she's being way too selfish for her character since there is also the execution rule where if we vote wrong, everyone dies, but the blackened. So where am I going with this? Now, I'm saying that the comic relief side that the writers handled here overshadows how a normal human being Himiko is supposed to act. A normal human being Himiko is still gonna defend her magic. But in the end, she would ultimately cave in and apologize for being this way since it would put everyone in danger. However, the writers wrote this segment in the Himiko comic relief mode in the sense that Wahey! Look, it's Himiko using her usual magic shtick! It's magic, it's magic! She ultimately tells us how her magic spell works, but looky looky, she still says that she made her escape using magic! Wahey! This last line of hers being told to us before moving on with the child tells me that they didn't take Himiko's character seriously here. This moment shows how her magic persona is used to cope with the situation. But more than anything, in the eyes of the fanbase, this will be seen as a dumb comic relief moment because it just wasn't treated seriously. The second problem that I find in this, alongside the comic relief role is, well, the execution rule, which makes this moment dumb in the eyes of many people because, well, her magic debate can ultimately end in people dying. If this execution rule did not exist, then it can open up a lot of interesting possibilities for different moments to happen. If that rule does not exist, then the Blacken doesn't graduate and doesn't escape. Nobody has to die. Thus, this magic debate moment wouldn't be seen as such a dumb moment on Himiko's part because if the rule didn't exist, nothing would be at stake. She wouldn't be seen as part of the problem where students might end up dead because of her. So yeah, like I said, I understand what Himiko was going through here. And for those of you who have watched my V3 series, instead of being annoyed, I was being understanding of what Himiko has been going through as well. This was never a moment that ruined Himiko in my eyes, but does it justify her actions here? Not really. And that is because of the way I see Himiko being handled here. And well, it ain't the first time, cause remember the fifth trial when she was being accused of murder? Now, this particular segment is a lot better in my eyes because not only is it understandable that Himiko acted that way, but she also apologized for the way she acted. She apologized to Maki. This is the human being Himiko that I know and love. But what was her next line after Maki told the truth? I didn't teach Himiko how to assemble the crossbow. She couldn't have used it. See? I told you! It's just like I said! Suspected me needs to apologize right now. This is the comic relief side of Himiko that was handled by the writers. Because once again, the writers were all like, hey, look, it's Himiko. Gotta have a cutesy laugh out loud comedic Himiko moment here because she ain't the brightest. Wahey! Like I said, I love the way Himiko was handled in the story. I love it, I love it. But there are small moments here and there where the writers had a tiny bit of a problem in balancing the comic relief Himiko and the human being Himiko. And it's not just her. This traces to Danganronpa in general where they have to balance comedy with serious moments. Also, before I end discussing this problem, I would like to offer you my own solution to the second child thing. This is how I would have handled Himiko. 
Himiko is trying to defend her status as a mage and telling everyone that it was a magic spell. But after a short amount of time, when people started accusing her of murder as well, she caves in and tells us how the magic worked, making her feel really sad. Knowing that her magic show was ruined, not only in that it was interrupted by Ryoma's body being eaten by the piranha, but by revealing how her magic spell worked. She apologizes to everyone for being stubborn and explains that she only wanted to make people smile, and her revealing how she did it was not what she wanted. She apologizes for putting people in danger and for using her magic in making people angry instead of happy. And then the trial continues, without any comedic moment coming from Himiko. Only sadness. Realizing that her using magic as a way to cope with the situation does not work, making her depend on Atua even more in the first chapter, leaving magic behind, accentuating her escapism struggles, until we finish chapter 3 and Himiko comes back the next day in chapter 4 once again, bringing back the love for magic. Kazing! I think that this would make the situation a lot better in people's eyes. Now, I'm gonna go into the problems that people may have regarding her, but me personally, I don't. First off, her being considered the biggest catchphrase machine. As you may know, I never had any problem with her mage persona. I was never annoyed. I always liked it. I always found her funny. Especially after chapter 3 where, in my eyes, they elevated the comedic possibilities even more for Himiko beyond the it's magic catchphrase. And for those of you who had a problem with that side of her where she always mentions magic and that she's a mage, I can understand if that bothered you in the first half of the game. This is more, this is on a subjective level here, but what I can tell you for sure is that she upgraded herself as a comic relief character a lot after chapter 3. Another problem is her being mean to Kibo. And... You know, I'm just gonna go off topic here a bit. Um, I love how in Mew and Kokichi's case, even if both of them are well known for insulting the students in god knows how many ways, especially in Mew's case where she just shits on everyone, they get away scot-free and are still well liked by the fanbase. But if Himiko is seen telling something bad to Kibo or anyone else once or twice that everybody loses their minds! Now of course, I'm not gonna act like Himiko is the sweetest angel in the world or something like that. She has her moments when she says stuff that can make her look bad. But let's go back to the topic of escapism a bit. <clears throat> now let me ask you, what are the side effects of escapism? Oh, there are many of them, I am sure, but one effect that is interesting to note is the risk of alienating yourself from friends, family, and just any person you come across. Himiko's mage persona is a form of escapism, in similar fashion to how Gundam's persona is that of an overlord, which is escapism too. Why do you think Gundam is the way he is? Because him being seen as an overlord is done so that he wouldn't need to interact with anyone to alienate people from approaching him. In Himiko's case, while she has that desire for making friends, that mage persona of hers has caused her over the years to affect her social skills. Thus, the way she interacts with people normally might end up badly. She tries to make a joke she thinks is great, the other person will think the joke is terrible and is offensive to the person the joke is being told to. She says something without thinking that what she said can hurt someone, it ends up hurting someone, etc. So, if there are moments when Himiko is seen as mean-spirited or anything like that, which can also include the debate in, in the second trial as well, it is because of her mage persona and lack of social skills. Her escapism and coping mechanisms severely hurt her interactions with reality. They cause her to lack awareness to what she says, and causes some of the characters to be offended by some of the stuff she says. Now, there are other problems that people have with her, but I already tackled them when I went through this analysis, and those are problems that are easily fixed if you try to look into Himiko a little more. Like, what she truly thought about Tenko after she died, her character development not being too sudden at the beginning of chapter 4, the crossbow event in chapter 5, and what else? Um, oh yeah, uh, I did hear some people say something about how she was at fault when it comes to Gonta's murder because of her chopsticks thing. I, I just, uh, I mean, what, what, what? 
Okay, there, there are problems, and then there is grasping for things to hate about a character that are just over-exaggerated and just plain dumb to think of them as actual problems. There are many other things I could discuss about Himiko. So, before I say my final conclusions, I would like to address one more thing that maybe not a lot of you are gonna notice when it comes to Himiko and V3 in general. Let me ask you, what are some of the themes you know that V3 has? There's truth and lies, there's logic and belief, there's fiction and reality, and I feel like I'm missing something here, but I'm not... Oh yeah, the... the... Dispersito and the... Shlup Dope Hamalama Ding Dong Ho... Blah blah blah, whatever. But... If we are to think about it, Himiko's theme of escapism also has a much larger importance to the game that isn't just tied to her character really. Because the last case talks about how the world is peaceful. Thus, people are using killing games as entertainment to escape their boring lives. Which includes the students who take part in these games. Hmm? Kind of interesting to think that Himiko's themes also have huge value in the overall story as well. In a similar way to how Shuichi has the theme of truth, Kokichi represents lies and logic, Kaito represents belief, etc. Alright, well, with that being said, it is time for us to wrap things up here. In the end, by this point, I think you already know what I truly feel about Himiko. She is my personal favorite of mine. She is a great character in my eyes and I love her. I like her personality, I like her quirkiness, she's funny, and has a lot of variety as a comic relief character as time goes on. She has a great story that has a beginning, middle and end, with her surviving and becoming a much better person. I never found her annoying when it comes to her mentioning magic and that she's a mage, but instead I find her endearing. Especially empowered by her love for doing magic shows in front of audiences to see her fans smile. Which I find it heartwarming. With that being said, I'm gonna give her the favorite heart and the love heart. Now, before I end this, I wanna answer the following question. Why did I make this video? Well, it ain't just because she's my favorite and I really wanted to talk about her and what makes her great, you know. But what is most important is for you people to get something out of this video. This video was specifically made for people who didn't really think much about Himiko or didn't really like her or didn't find her that interesting at all, who never looked that much into her. This video was made so that you can see that there is more to Himiko than what you may think. And if you are now seeing Himiko in a much better light, and even starting to like her, or have her as your new favorite because of all the stuff I said in this video, then, then I'd be the happiest man in the world. And if you want to know more, like hear some thoughts about Himiko that I didn't address in this, you can check other sources, like for example there's Jules' video analysis on Himiko that you can find on YouTube. And I also have like an analysis document on my phone done by another person and I hope I'll be able to put a link to it in the description. And there are many other sources. Because while I do know that she has her fans, she still feels to me like an underrated character, that many people don't really look too much into her. That there are people out there who, if you are to ask them why they have Himiko as their favorite, all they're gonna say is that it's because she's funny and that she's cute, and not much else. Which is a shame, because while some people are gonna think of her as the third wheel in a group of survivors, I myself see her as one of the strongest points that came from V3 in my eyes. The strongest ultimate mage that ever lived, Himiko Yumeno. Thanks for watching, ladies and gents.